right, now we live. Now we are the live on Facebook. As y'all checking in, you can leave a comment and shout yourselves out. Sometimes the comments take a minute to come through on Facebook, IG. Y'all can leave your comment. It's Instagram, so those comments come through instantly. And Periscope, if you're checking in on Periscope, I think this is working on Periscope. If it is, you can shout yourselves out in the comment section. I don't know, the internet, internet connection is a little janky here today. I don't know why. But now Facebook telling me theirs is not live. So let's see. Now we're going to have to restart Facebook. As y'all checking in again, shout yourselves out. What's going on? Bell Floor 2020. What's good? As y'all checking in, checking in again, shout yourselves out in the comment section. We're going to get started in 10 seconds. We're just making sure that we got all of these lives going at the same time. It gets it can get kind of funny out here sometimes when you got all of these going at once. So Periscope, I believe, is working. I'm not quite sure. Instagram is working. I had to do Instagram twice. But we got that working and now I'm trying to get Facebook working and Facebook is also giving me some complications here. So as you are checking in again, shout yourselves out. We're going to get started in a moment. Let me see if we can get this this going the way that I need to get going. Somebody said the white man is trying to. Stop. No, I don't think so. We got the white tee on, so I think they I think they are right with what we got going on. Again, you can shout yourselves out in the comment section. Tell me your name and location as you are checking in. As you are coming in, shout yourselves out. Tell me your name and location. We're going to get started in, hopefully we get started in about 10 seconds. I'm just making sure that this live is working on Facebook. I think we got it working on Periscope. I know we got it working on Instagram. At least it's working right now. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, former nine-year professional athlete, author of 27 books, including this book right here, Working Your Game, including this book that I'm going to tell you how to get for free. It is called The Mirror of Motivation. I'm going to tell you how to get this free at the end of this presentation right here. I think we got Facebook working finally. I think we got Periscope working finally. So Facebook, Periscope, as y'all checking in, I'm telling y'all at the end of this presentation, I'm going to tell you how to get this book right here for free, the physical copy of the book. So over here on IG, let me see who we got coming in j monkey was good a go ninophobia checking in from portland shout out to portland oregon we got boston in the house today what we're going to talk about i got this list of the best advice that i ever got from bosses that i worked for now these days i am a ceo owner of my company work on your game i don't have a boss but i have had bosses i worked a lot of jobs so before i even started playing pro basketball i had worked at like 10 different jobs I started working when I was a teenager, like 14 years old. I started getting jobs and working. My parents was like, yeah, you, know, you need to learn how to work. So you can go out there and you know, do what you need to do, make yourself some money, because it's going to come a point we ain't giving you no more money. If you want, some, you want anything other than food, clothing, shelter, you're going to have to pay for it. And they weren't joking. So I had to go out there and start earning it. So I had a lot of jobs, not no like serious career type jobs, but jobs. And in doing so, working all those jobs, I got a lot of things that I learned from people who were in charge, managers, supervisors, you know, things like that. And I put together this list of the best advice I ever got from my bosses. I think I got like 10 things here. I'm not gonna give you all 10 today. I'm, I'm gonna give you maybe, we'll break this down to either two parts or three parts. So I'll either give you like three or four today, then we'll just see how long it takes me to give the rest of them and we'll break this into three parts or we'll break it into two parts. So what we're gonna talk about is the best advice that I got from bosses at work. And all of these are, will pretty much be self-explanatory within themselves. Once I tell you what the advice was, what it meant to me, why it matters to me and why it matters to you moving forward. So all that said, again, for those of you who don't know me, I've written 27 books. I created this philosophy. It's called Work On Your Game. It's about taking the tools that you need to succeed in sports and teaching how those same tools apply to business and life. So these, these pieces of advice that I got from my bosses, these can apply for athletes. They can apply for a freelancer. They can apply for a student. They can apply for anybody trying to get a job right now. You're just trying to find your way in life. They can apply for anyone. So let's get right into it without further ado. Number one piece of advice that I got from a boss was learn how to sell yourself. And let me tell you how I acquired this information. I was working at this store called Hat World. Those of you who go to malls and stuff, you know there's a store called Lids that sells all hats and there's a store called Hat World. They sell all hats. They're like in competition with each other. So I was working, this had to be my, this is like my freshman year of college. So I'm in college playing on a basketball team, but I had a job at the same time. So I remember my freshman year of college, I used to come to practice and school all the time with like, back then we used to wear guest jeans. So we had the, I had all these guest jeans and I would have all these new pairs of sneakers and I would have jerseys because that's when we was wearing jerseys back in, this is like 2000 and stuff like that. And I would come with this stuff to school all the time, my freshman year of college. 
and my teammates on the basketball team was like, yo, your parents must be giving you mad money. They thought I was being spoiled by my parents when the truth is my parents weren't giving me shit. They were giving me absolutely zero dollars. I was getting all my money because I had a job while at the same time I was going to school. And my teammates would see me with all this stuff. And I remember I was working at Hat World and of course Hat World is all hats. So I had all these hats that I was buying on discount and stuff like that and hooking my friends up and all with the employee discount and all that. And the manager in Hat World, has any of you ever been inside a Hat World or a Lid store? You know, the store is pretty small. It's like a tiny little store. And again, all they got is hats. So it's not even that much work. And for the majority of the day during the week, any of you ever go to a mall on like today's Wednesday, you go to a mall on a Wednesday in the middle of the week it's empty. It ain't nothing going on. The workers are just standing there hanging out, talking to each other, folding clothes and stuff like that. Now, we in the hat store, so there ain't no clothes to fold. We just standing there talking and it would be me because I was just a regular employee. And there was two managers. There was this white dude named Jay, and it was the main manager, the person in charge of the store is a black woman. I forget her name. But anyway, she was the one who I would talk to the most. She was like the same age as my mom, and she had kids who was like the same age as me. So I would talk to her all the time, and I would just ask her questions because obviously she's a lot older than me, and she knew the game of retail management. So she knew how to be in, she knew how to run a store, she knew how to hire employees, and I built a good rapport with her before I even had the job because I used to work at McDonald's in the same mall. So when I worked at McDonald's and I saw that hat store open, I used to come in there just to look at the hats. And I used to have my McDonald's uniform on and the woman was in there and I would always speak to her like, hey, how you doing? And I was very polite and I was nice to her. And I was like, yo, can, can I get a job here? Because I was tired of working at McDonald's. I ain't like smelling like French fries and smelling like those greasy ass burgers every day when I got done working. I was like, why not just work in a hat store? It ain't nothing, no such thing as smelling like a hat. So let me go work in a hat store. So I used to just talk to her and I, used, I just worked her. I used to come in there like every time I was at work, I was just coming there on my break. Hey, how you doing? Look at a couple of hats. No, no, just chatter up a little bit. And she started to like me. And then when it was time for uh, her to actually hire somebody, she was like, all right, I'll hire you. So she hired me. I quit McDonald's. The manager at McDonald's was mad because I quit. But anyway, I went and worked this hat store and I would ask her, yo, how do you and she told me all these jobs that she used to have. She used to be a manager at like the department stores, at foot lockers, at you no know, prep food stores, re all other kinds of retail management. She used to have all these jobs in management. She was like a career manager. And I asked her, how did you get all these jobs? Because mind you, I'm like 18, 19 at this time. And I don't know about, I don't know how y'all are these days. Those of y'all who are younger, when you are, if you're like under the age of 25, y'all let me know. When you are 18, 19, were y'all trying to get jobs? What were y'all trying to do for work? Did your parents say you had to get a job? Because that's how it was for my generation. All the kids that I grew up around, all of our parents was like, you need to go get a job. So every weekend, we go to the mall. We have our little ink pen with us. And this is before the internet was the internet. No smartphones. You had to go up there and ask for the application, a paper application, fill it out in the food, sit in the food court, fill out the application, and then go hand them the piece of paper and hope that somebody called you back. So... We used to do this all the time and it was hard to get a job because everybody was trying to get one. We try to get a job at any place that we like. We like the music store, we like the sneaker stores, we liked, those are the things we like the best. The music stores and the sneaker store. That's where we wanted to work because we get the little discount, we get the hookup, everybody be coming in there, we get to see the girls, all that. And I could never get a job. I used to apply a Foot Locker all the time and they never, they never hired me. I went to a music store, uh, job interview, they didn't hire me. It's only a few times in my life I went to a job interview and didn't get the job. But I wasn't getting them. I finally got this job at the hat store. And I just asked her, because she had all these jobs. So how'd you get the job? And she would tell me, look, I went in the interview and I sold myself. And she kept saying that. She told me all these stories. I work here. I was like, how'd you get the job? She said, I work here. I was like, how'd you get it? She worked here. I was like, how'd you get it? And she would always tell the story. And she would always say, man, I just sold myself. I went in the job interview and I sold myself. And I asked her, what do you mean when you say sell yourself? I've never heard anybody use that phrase. This is, again, I was like 18. I said, I never heard, I never heard anybody say sell yourself she said what i meant is i would just tell them my credentials i would tell them what i've done this is my resume i would tell them how i could help their store be better and i would just make myself i would position myself in the best possible light so i could look really good in the eyes of the people in charge and it was working i knew how to sell myself and promote myself and you know talk myself up not lying telling the truth but making myself look good showing my best possible traits and that's how i got that job and that was one of the the best pieces of advice and she wasn't even giving me advice. She was just telling me a story, but I'm the type of person, I'm a sponge. So when I hear some good information, I retain it. Even if they're not trying to give it to me, they're just saying something, I notice it and I remember it. And that was, this is like 20 years ago, she told me that. And I got a course nowadays called Sell Yourself. It's all about 
how do you sell yourself? How do you market and promote yourself and get people to know you, like you, and trust you if they have no idea who you are? So selling yourself is one of the most important things that I had to do as an athlete, just to get on playing sports, playing professionally, playing overseas, I had to sell myself. To get people to you know, read my books, I gotta sell myself. To get you to even listen to what I'm gonna say after the first point, I gotta sell you with a good enough first point that you listen to the second point. So there's always, you always have to sell yourself. Nowadays, as a professional speaker, I gotta sell myself. If I'm gonna do a TED Talk, sell myself. To get a client, I'm selling myself. I tell you to sign up for my, some product that I'm selling. I don't care if the product costs a dollar, I gotta sell it to you. This book, I'm telling you it's free, I still got to sell you on why you want to get this book. I mean, why do you even want, need to waste your time? You go on YouTube and watch videos all day. Why even put time into getting a book, even though it's free? There's a sale that must happen. So learning how to sell is one of the most important skills any human being can have. And selling yourself is the first thing that you need to learn how to sell. Before you sell anything else, you got to learn how to sell yourself. Point number two, the topic here today, we're talking about the best advice that I ever got from bosses in my life. Now I'll do the first three or maybe the first four here today. Number two. I was working at this restaurant called Friendly's. And this is before that. This is when I had to be like 15, 16. And those of you, many of you probably don't even know what Friendly's is. Friendly's was, it was a, a pretty prominent restaurant, at least in the Northeast part of the United States. Now I'm from Philadelphia, PA. I live in Miami now, but I'm from Philly. So back then, Friendly's was a pretty big place. You found, it was all over the place. It was in the malls. It, you find it outside of the malls, everywhere. So I had this job and this is a restaurant that mostly specialized in. They had regular food. It was like a diner, but like a step above a diner, a half a step above a diner where you get regular food. But what they um, specialized in was ice cream. So like ice cream sundaes, banana splits, all these like, um, I don't even, I wouldn't even call it gourmet, but all these like fancy little sundaes. This is mostly for kids. So it'd be like, make a little sundae, put a little smiley face on it with the candies and stuff like that. And I, my first job working there, I was the, they called it the fountain person. And the fountain was making the sundaes. So anytime somebody ordered a Sunday, like ice cream Sunday for their kids, because what it was was this kind of restaurant where a parent would come in with these two young kids, like an eight year old and a five year old. And one of them wants a banana split and the other one wants some fancy ice cream Sunday. And they didn't even buy food. They just wanted the ice cream. So my job was to make all the ice cream Sundays. So you had to know how to make it look and which ice cream to use and put the fruits on it, put the little candy on it and all that. And I remember at this time, I'm 15, 16, so I don't have no car. And I'm working at the mall, which was like an hour away from my crib. So I had to catch the bus to get home every night. Now, I was on the closing shift a lot of times in the summertime. And y'all know the close. any of y'all ever worked in food service, you know, when you're on the schedule and it says closing, what does that actually mean? If the restaurant closes at 11, what time are you actually leaving? If, the, if you're on a closing shift at a restaurant and it says you get off at close, what time are you actually walking out of the building? You're not walking out at 11. You're walking out of that thing like 12 o'clock, 12.30. Closing means you stay until the whole place is clean and the manager says you can leave. That's pretty much what it means when you're on the closing ship. So I'm on the closing ship at this restaurant and I gotta clean up my, everybody's responsible for their section. So all the waiters and waitresses, they had to clean up their section. The cooks had to clean up that. The, the uh, what's the, the dishes guy, they had to clean up the dish room. The manager had to check everybody's stuff and make sure it was okay and then you could leave. But here's the problem. Because I work at this place that's an hour away from my house, I don't have a car. Nobody who worked there lived near me because most of it was mostly like more like white people who was from the suburbs out near that mall. I was from in the city. Most of us didn't catch, most of them didn't catch the bus home. So this last bus, I remember this because you had to know, yeah, somebody said 12, 12, 30. That's, that's how it is. So the last bus that left the mall to go back to my place left at 11.56 p.m. every night. 11.56, I knew the schedule. And y'all know, if you used to catch the bus, you knew the schedule by heart, like what time you need to be at that bus stop, because if you miss that bus, it's a wrap. So <laughs> I had to get on that bus at 11.56. Now one night, for whatever reason, everybody's taking all long to leave. Maybe we had late customers, something happened, but we're just taking mad long. And I'm like, yo, this bus is coming in like 15 minutes. It's like 11.40, I know the bus is coming. I can see that we're not gonna be done with our work, but the manager's not gonna tell me it's okay for me to leave because he ain't gonna say that everything's done. Now, the manager was this, this fat white dude from the suburbs. He didn't, know, he didn't understand the concept of me needing to get this bus because I had no other way to get home. So I you know, tried to kind of sort of drop a hint to him that, yo, I need to get on this bus. And he's like, yo, nobody can leave until everything's done. And he's the thing. Here's the thing. He was like a newer manager. So he wasn't like a seasoned manager who was really established and he knew he had everybody's respect. He was a newer dude. And this made it worse because when you got a new manager, What's a new, what does new, a new boss do when they come into a job? 
They try to establish their, that they're serious, that they're for real. You can't take advantage of me. They try to lay down the law and make sure they're being respected. So I knew that he wasn't going to let me leave until he let everybody else leave, right? Because then it would look like he was being soft. And then he would be like, I'm thinking that he's thinking that everybody's going to try to walk over him. So I'm trying to think how he's thinking. So I know he's not going to let me leave, but I'm going to miss this bus. And I ain't got no way to get home. It's not like I could call somebody and be like, yo, come drive an hour up here to the mall and come get me. I had to get on this goddamn bus. I was not going to get home. So it gets to like 11.53. And y'all know sometimes the bus comes a little bit early. And you ever try to catch the bus and you see it sitting there, but you know you're behind it. So you're trying to catch up to where the bus is at. It's just sitting there waiting. Because you're like, yo, at any minute, this driver could close the doors and pull off and it's over. So I see the bus. I, look, I open the back door to the restaurant and I can see the bus. Now, I didn't leave. I just peeked out there. I'm like, if, if I see the bus out there, I got to leave. So I see the bus out the back door. Dude didn't let me, let me leave yet. His name was Bill. And everybody's still cleaning up. They're still taking long. It's like 11.56. It gets to like 11.55. I'm like, I can't miss this fucking bus. So I didn't say nothing to Bill. I just grabbed my shit quietly out the employee room. I just snuck out the back room, <laughs> the back door, and I left. <laughs> and I called the bus. I got on the bus and I got home. It was all good. So then this is what happened. I called the store the next day because y'all know, and any of y'all worked in retail, y'all know how it goes. Every week you call the store and be like, yo, somebody tell me what's the next day that I'm on the schedule. So you know the next time you come in and you can get your schedule. So I call in and say, yo, can somebody tell me the next day that I'm on the schedule? This is Dre. And the guy who answered the phone, he was cool with me. And he went, he's like, yeah, hold on. He go look at the schedule. He comes back to the phone. He's like, yo, dog, you're not on the schedule. <laughs> they, you ain't on the schedule at all for the next week. And I'm like, damn, what, what the hell happened? So I was like, yo, put the manager on the phone. They put the manager on the phone. The man, one of the other managers was like, yo, Dre, we didn't put you on the schedule because Bill said you left the other night without telling him and he, he didn't give you the okay to leave. And you know, you know, we can't be having that, this and that. So I ended up coming up there one day because I'm trying to save my job. I'm only 15, 16. And I see the dude, Bill. And he's like, look, man, for you to keep this job, I need people I can trust. I already told the other managers, I don't want you on my schedule anymore because I can't trust you. I can't trust that you always going to be there. So this second point that I'm giving y'all here, best advice that I learned from bosses, and this pretty much got me released from that job, was you need people on your team you can trust. Now, I'm not mad at Bill for feeling how he felt because, again, he didn't know. He didn't understand what I understood, and I didn't understand what he understood. I actually knew what he meant. I knew exactly where he was coming from, but I didn't give a fuck because I had to get home. I had no way to get home. Not like I could walk, and he wasn't going to give me a ride. But at the same time, I understand he didn't know me. He was just trying to get established, and I basically disrespected him by leaving like that. So I get it. I'm not even mad at him for me losing my job over that, but I had to do what I had to do. He had to do what he had to do, and it just worked out that way. And nowadays, as a CEO, I understand that. If I got somebody working for me, I got to be able to trust you. I got to know that if I give you the job, you're going to get the job done. If I tell you to do something, you're going to do it. That I know you're going to do your job and not just be trying to you know, get paid without doing the work. Because if you're doing that, then I'm going to get rid of you. And that's the same thing that happened to me. So I respect the game of how that happened. And that story is just a, a good example of the way that that, you know, just the way that that works out in all of life. So any of you, if you ever get a job somewhere, being dependable is one of the most valuable things you can do on a job. Even if you're not the most spectacular worker, you might not even be the most talented or the most productive. But if you're dependable and they know you're going to show up and do the job consistently, that's worth something. That's worth money. Third thing. Today, I'm telling you the best advice that I ever got from bosses in my life. I might do four of them today. Third thing is what was happening here. Oh, yeah. I was working out of L.A. Fitness. Now, this was... This is in the middle of my career. Actually, this is the last regular job that I had. Now, this is not in chronological order. But this is the last regular job I had. I was working at L.A. Fitness. This is right before I got a gig in Montenegro. I wrote about this in my book. In this book right here, I wrote about this story. So, this is right before I got my gig playing in Montenegro. I'm working at L.A. Fitness in Tampa Bay, Florida. And my job there, I was not selling memberships. And I was not a personal trainer. They had this, this little other group of people whose very job was to sell the personal training but you weren't an actual personal trainer. So my job was any of you ever joined the gym and you know when you join the gym, somebody calls you like the next day and they're like, yo, I wanna invite you to a free personal training session or a free fitness assessment or whatever they call it, some bullshit like that. I never took advantage of those, but a lot of people do. So when somebody joins the gym, they get a free fitness assessment. So any of you ever join the gym, they give you that. They're not really trying to give you an assessment. They really don't give a damn if you're in shape or not. 
All they're trying to do is give you a sample personal training session and then they're gonna try to sell you personal training. That's the reason why they're doing it, all right? They are not, there's no such thing as a free lunch, people. They're not giving you a free workout or a free training session. Nobody does that. They would be losing money if they did that. So my job, it was like me and like two other dudes. All our job was, the three of us, was to get people to get that free session and we were supposed to work them out and then try to sell them personal training. And then if they bought personal training, we didn't even do the training. It was a whole group of trainers whose very job was to do training. So you had the salespeople who sold the memberships, us who sold the training, and then the trainers who did the training. So it's three different groups. I'm in that part of selling training. So the dude who was in charge of the trainers is, was this guy named Jeff. Now Jeff was this super bro, white dude, beach, beach bum white dude with uh, spiked hair. He had this spiked hair and it was super blonde, like platinum blonde, spiked hair. Big ass muscles, real buff. He probably took steroids. He's the type of dude to carry around a gallon jug of water all day. Y'all know those white dudes with the gallon jug of water everywhere they go? That was Jeff, all right, with the big muscles and all that. And his chest all puffed out and he had these tight ass, you know, LA Fitness, we got these polo shirts. He got the shirt all tight, like a, like a uh, strength and conditioning coach for a football team somewhere. That's how he was, this dude Jeff. He was a, a geek, but he probably, he's probably on steroids. But anyway. Jeff would tell us, me and these other two dudes who sold the personal training, I'm like, all right, Jeff, look, how are we supposed to sell this training? Because we're on commission, you know what I'm saying? So we wanted to sell training. If ever I got somebody to show up for that free session, this is what I would do. I'll tell you what I did. I would take them through a workout, and this is how you sell personal training. Any of you ever sell training, I'm going to tell you how you do it. You put somebody through a workout, don't charge them, and you kick their fucking ass. You make them feel so out of shape. You make them feel so terrible about how out of shape they are. You just put them through a tough ass workout. When I used to sell gym memberships, this is what I would do. I would walk somebody around the gym and if they had any kind of workout gear on, I would put them through a workout and I would have them use the machines. I'm like, what you wanna work on? A woman might say something like, I wanna work on my hips, I don't wanna work on my arms, I wanna work on my butt. So I would put them on machines to work their hips, their arms, their butt so they could see. I'm like, all right, can you feel it? In those areas, they would say, yeah. And then I would take them all around the gym and I would always end the, the tour of the gym in the cardio area. And I would put them on a treadmill, right? So I get them on the treadmill and I'd be explaining how the treadmill is good for your body and how it is not gonna be hurting your knees or your ankles because the treadmill is not concrete. And then I would just slowly turn up the speed and then I have them running on the treadmill until they got out of breath. Then I would stop it and then I bring them in the room and then I sell them a membership and they so out of shape and fucked up. They like, damn, they realized how out of shape they were. And in that moment, I would sell them personal training or I would sell them a membership to the gym. So it's the same thing I did at LA Fitness. I'll put them through this hard ass workout to show them how out of shape they really were. And then I would sell them personal training. Now, the only way we could do that though is if people who signed up for the gym accepted this free workout. So me, if I join the gym and they call me for the free workout, I'm like, yo, I'm not interested. I don't even answer the phone. But some people take it. But we would run out of leads sometimes. We didn't have enough people to call on the phone to get that free session. So we'd be standing there with Jeff like, yo, how are we supposed to get anybody else to get this training? Because what we called everybody, ain't nobody else to call. What are we supposed to do? So this is what Jeff said to do. And this is the third piece of advice, third best piece of advice that I got from somebody. Jeff said, look around the gym. He would say, just walk around the gym floor while people are in here working out. And if you see somebody, this is, what, this is the exact phrase that he said. <laughs> he said, if you see somebody working out wrong, go help them out and then offer them personal training. That was his advice. All right, this was Jeff's training. All right, this, so that's how I knew he was a, a beach bum idiot. Just, he just had big muscles. That's the only way he had the job. He did not know what he was talking about. He said, if you see somebody working out wrong, help them out and then offer them personal training. That was his advice, which was completely useless. But he did have a good, he, his general point was good. Its application made no sense, but its general point was good. And this is something that I tell people all the time when it comes to sales. There's three steps to selling in life. Only three steps. Number one, identify a need. Identify something that people need. Identify a problem that people have. That's what Jeff was talking about. Identify a need. You see somebody who does, it looks like they don't know what they're doing. That is a need. Number two, go and either acquire or create the solution to their problem. So if you realize that somebody needs a ride to work, but they don't have one, the solution is a car or Uber or a bus pass. That's the solution. And then number three, offer them something in exchange for the solution. So let them know about the solution and tell them how they can get it. So Jeff had the right idea, but he was very, very bad at explaining it. So this is the third point is find out what people need. When you identify what people need, find someone who needs help and you can help them, that's a business opportunity. Every time you see somebody with a problem and you can solve it, it's a business opportunity. Now, if someone has a problem and you can't solve it, that is not a business opportunity. So if you see somebody who's out of shape 
but you're not a personal trainer, that's not really an opportunity unless you're gonna create like, you create Uber for personal trainers. That's the idea for somebody right there. Uber for personal trainers. You connect the trainers to the people who need to work out, you take a cut of the money in between. That's exactly what Uber does. So that's three. I'll give y'all, I'll give y'all one more. All right, let's do 40s. All right, so this is the last one I'm gonna do today. Today I'm telling you the best advice I ever got from bosses, and I'm gonna break this down into two or three parts. So this is another job I had in my in er, younger days, early teens, maybe 15, 16 years old. I'm working at Pizza Hut, right? Now, at Pizza Hut, during the day, again, same thing. This is in like the summertime, middle of the day. There's nobody in there. But every day at like 12 o'clock, we would have a, a salad bar, like a, a lunch buffet. And we would put all these different pizzas out there, be a salad in there, some bread sticks. This is back when Pizza Hut actually had quality ingredients. What they're doing these days, I have no idea. But what they, back in the day, Pizza Hut actually had quality ingredients. So I'm working in there, it's like a Tuesday, there's nobody in there, and it's me and one other dude working. And the dude working was the manager, his name was Terrell. And Terrell was like, no, the salad, the lunch bar buffet was about to come up. And I ain't have nothing to do. Terrell's in the back making the pizzas and stuff. I'm like, Terrell, what can I do to help? Like, what can I do to help get us ready for this buffet? And he was like, um, Dre, you wanna make the salad? And I was like, cool, yeah, I'll make the salad. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna make the salad. So I'm like, now, I'm, I get the bowl and all that, and I'm like, Terrell, I don't actually know what goes in a salad. Now, I had eaten salad plenty of times in my life, but I had never made a salad. So I'm like, just to be sure, Terrell, tell me what goes in a salad. So Terrell, starts, he just starts saying, so he's like, man, you don't know how to make a salad. All right, man, look, you put, uh, you say your name is Terrell, same pronunciation, that's what's up. So he said, all right, man, put some tomatoes, put some onions, put some uh, chopped up carrots, put some radishes, put some croutons in it. And yeah, that was that's pretty much all he said. He might have said one other thing. I don't remember. So everything that he said, though, I remember exactly what he said. And I went into the, the walk in refrigerator and I grabbed everything he said and I put it all in the bowl and I grabbed everything. Everything he said, I got in there. I was paying attention. So I walked back up to Terrell. He's still making pizzas and I'm holding the bowl in my hand. It's a big ass salad bowl, clear plastic salad bowl. And I'm like, all right, is this is this it? Did I make it right? And he looks at the bowl and he does a double take. And then he looks up at me. And he starts smiling and I'm still I'm standing there waiting for him to say yes or no. And then he starts laughing and I'm standing there like, what the hell is he laughing? At? I'm just standing here holding the salad and he, he keeps laughing. He starts laughing so much. Now, Terrell's a big dude. He's like a, a heavy set guy. So he's laughing so much. His whole body is like shaking up and down like this. And he starts crying because he's laughing so hard. And mind you, me and him, the only two people in the whole story. And finally, he stops laughing. And he starts talking. He's like wiping tears out of his eyes. And he's like, yo. Where's the lettuce? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm looking at him like, yo, you did not say lettuce, dude. You said tomatoes, onions, croutons, radishes, olives, everything you said, I put in the bowl. You didn't say anything about lettuce. And he was like, and he said something to the effect of, I assume you knew to put lettuce in a salad. I thought you already knew that. And this is my fourth point. All right, this is the fourth best piece of advice I got from a boss. And this wasn't even advice that he told me. This is something that I deduced from the situation. He assumed that I knew that salad goes that lettuce goes in a salad but i didn't know that which is why i had asked him what goes in a salad and he said all these things he assumed that i knew that salad was the base but i didn't and i would end up putting that bowl out there with no lettuce and people would have been like what the hell is this and the point that i want y'all to take from this and this is something that i know these days because you know i hire people i delegate jobs to people i codify work and tell people hey here's what you need to do understand you can't leave out steps when you're teaching somebody something you don't assume that they know anything my sister, for example, she worked as a she told me that she worked as a um, investment banker when she got out of college. Now she had a degree from an Ivy League college and she got a job as an investment banker. And I said, well, you got a degree from an Ivy League school. Did they assume that you knew certain things when you got the job? And she said, no, they taught us from the ground up as if we knew absolutely nothing. And that is the point. And that was a, I think it was like UBS. She was working for UBS is a huge company, big companies like that. McDonald's, Foot Locker, Hat World, UBS. All Apple, any of these companies, you get a job with them, they train you as if you know absolutely nothing. Why is that? Because the process is so tight. They don't assume that you have the information. Because if you assume somebody knows something and then they don't know it, whose fault is that? It's your fault as the boss because you did not teach it. Anything you don't teach, don't assume that they know. I'll give you an example. Phil Jackson, Chicago Bulls coach, Michael Jordan's coach, every year in training camp, you know if Phil Jackson would have his players practice? He would teach them how to throw a chess pass. And then you basketball player, he would teach them how to throw a bounce pass. Here's how you throw a post-entry pass. Here's the footwork you need to use when you set a screen. 
Now, mind you, he's working with Michael Jordan, Kobe, Shaquille O'Neal, Scotty Pippen, the best players in the world. He's teaching them how to throw a chess pass. Why? Because Phil Jackson did not assume that any of them had the fundamentals in place. John Wooden, legendary UCLA coach, won like 11 championships in college basketball, something like that, the most ever. When his players came to UCLA, he would teach them how to put their sneakers on, how to tie their shoes, and how to put on their socks properly. Why? Because that kept them from getting blisters on their feet if they learn how to tie their shoes the right way. I'm telling you that to tell you this. The people who are the best at what they do do not skip steps. They do not assume anybody has information that they haven't taught. So do not assume anybody knows anything, especially when you're the person in charge. So all of that being said, I'm going to break this down again. I'm going to break this down in like two or three parts. So tomorrow I'm going to do another part. And then after that, I'll do it. I might break it down to two parts. I might do it in three. But that's all I'm going to give you all today. So these four points that I told you here today, what I learned in the hat world is learn how to sell yourself. Uh, learn, know that you need people you can depend on. I learned that when I got fired from Friendlies. Find somebody who needs help and help them out. I learned that at LA Fitness. And do not assume that people know something just because you know it. I learned that working at Pizza Hut. So all that being said, I will take questions in a moment. First, let me do what I promised I would do and tell you how to get this book. This is called The Mirror of Motivation, self God, and Self-Discipline. I made this book for free. Well, I didn't make it for free. I made this book free for you. All you got to do is go to mirrorofmotivation.com. You take care of a small shipping charge. I will ship this to you worldwide, anywhere that you live. Why do you want this book? Because everybody who's listening to this has goals. Everyone here is willing to do the work. Question is, who do you need to be? Who do you need to be? What type of energy do you need to have? How do you need to show up when you walk into a room? How do you want people to feel when they see you? How do you want to feel when you look at yourself in the mirror? This book is not going to tell you who to be. It's going to give you the frameworks so you can tell yourself who to be. Because that's why, that's why it's called the mirror of motivation. Not because I'm going to tell you who to be. That doesn't make sense. You need to tell yourself because you determine what your life is going to look like. This book gives you the frameworks to do that. Go to mirrorofmotivation.com. That's mirrorofmotivation.com. The book is already paid for. It's a free book. All you do is cover the shipping. I will ship you the physical book. This book right here, worldwide, anywhere that you live, mirrorofmotivation.com. All that said, let's get to see if we got any questions here in the comments section. If you got one, go ahead and post it right now. Agonophobia said they always think they're trying to steal, so I never get my dollars in. You talking about the hat store? <laughs> And go say, except for the Orlando Magic snapback. Yeah, the Orlando Magic, the pinstripe joint was fire. You're right about that. Yeah, 12 to 12.30. If they say if the restaurant closed at 11, you're not leaving until 12.30. That's a fact. Mozart says public transportation days were rough. <laughs> well, I'm glad I went through those days. Now, when I have kids, I don't have kids. But when I do, they probably won't have to go through those days. They ain't going, they're not going to have the same, they ain't going to have the same sensibilities. Because <laughs> they didn't have to do that. Mozart said the trainer was giving out unsolicited advice. Yeah, but that was his that was his uh that was his method for signing people up for personal training. It's a little bit different, Mozart, if they already in your facility. Now if they're in the gym and you offer them advice, it's different than if you just walk up to a random person. Because he was a trainer, so. And he had big muscles. Again, I think he was I think those was uh, uh performance enhancing drug muscles, but they were muscles one way or another. Uh Wham Wham Wells, uh, you remember that story. Ballaholic of oh, Terrell, same pronunciation, yes. I think his name might have been spelled the same way. Question is, have you encountered any detractors at a speaking conference or through emails, DMs? Well, emails, DMs, of course. <laughs> if you're on the internet, of course you want to get detractors. I don't even call them detractors. You call them, it's like trolling. Trolling is a normal thing, though, so it doesn't. I've been on the internet for so long, it's not even a, you don't even remember them. Baller Hallwick said, I'm a teacher. You really cannot leave our steps. Yeah, that's a fact. You leave our steps, then there's going to be people's results are going to be janky and you're going to be wondering what happened. Sports Lover said, Did customers ever yell at you? What should an employee do if he ever gets cussed out or screamed at? I think one time I was working at a gym and some dude came in. He was mad because the gym kept charging him money after he thought he canceled his membership. <laughs> he wasn't yelling at me. I didn't do it. He was just yelling in general and I happened to be standing at the front desk. But I didn't, I didn't take it that he was mad at me. He didn't know who I was. He was just mad at the company. And he didn't know where to direct his anger. But then one of the, like, the managers came and grabbed him and they you know, took care of him, I guess. I don't know. I don't even know what happened. But I remember him coming in and he just started yelling at the front desk for no reason. He's like an old man. Wham Well says, as an employee, what's one thing you would have done differently? In my working life, in those situations, probably nothing. Those are good learning experiences just to go through them and 
no work regular job, no quote unquote regular jobs and have bosses and have to show up and do the work every day. That's all part of the discipline too. I'm glad I went through those experiences because now I wouldn't value being in a position of being able to hire people if I had never gone through being the person who got hired. Adrian said, do I shop at Macy's? Um, not really. I don't really shop at department stores. If I go to a department store, I take my, my stylist with me. I take my lady with me. She's my personal stylist. So she helps me pick out the, the good looking clothes. I'm not a real, listen, you see my fashion right here. All right, I get this off. I get these off Amazon, 10 in a pack for 20 bucks. But I, got, I know somebody who knows the fashion game and the style game a lot better than me. So when I need anything like that, I need me some new shoes. I need a suit. I need to get some, some stage clothes. And I, I bring somebody who knows, the, knows that game. I don't know that game. And I don't try to know that game. I know, I know what I know. Which is this, this stuff right here. This is what I know. I find somebody who knows what I don't know. Ball Hog says, how do you feel about dress codes? I'm a teacher. I want to do things my way. I'm not the suit and tie type. I feel my value as a teacher worth more. Would you wear a suit and tie if you were a teacher? That's a good question. You know, I used to think no. I used to say, no, nah, I'm not going to wear maybe not a suit and tie, but you could wear like a button up. I don't know if I need a teacher to wear a suit and tie. A suit is like very formal. But if I'm a teacher, I'm going to wear something that looks, um, I want to look quote unquote professional. How most people see professional means like a button up, some slacks. No, look like somebody who's a teacher. Look like a, if you picture the teacher, you Google take teacher, you will see a picture of somebody in some slacks and a button up because that's just what people expect. So being that you got to sell yourself to those parents and you got to sell yourself to the kids, then I would wear it just because of that. That's the reason why I would wear it. Even as a professional speaker, for example, when I first started speaking, I used to have these cheap clothes. I used to have these cheap pants and cheap shoes and cheap shirt before I met my, my girl. And when she saw that stuff, she was like, what you going to wear when you do your speaking? She was like, you can't wear that stuff that you got because people are not going to respect you. They're not going to respect your message. Even though you got great material, they're going to look at your clothes and be like, this dude don't know what he's talking about. Let's look at his clothes. But if you got nice looking clothes, then they're going to listen to what you have to say because your clothes are going to say more about you than even your speech. So remember that uh, most communication is nonverbal. Like 85 percent of communication is nonverbal. So. It's not really about the value of what comes out of your mouth. It's the way you present yourself as well helps sell you to your audience. So the way you present yourself, that's going to draw a certain type of audience. And in the speaking world, to answer your question, Balgaholic, I was told uh, always outdress your audience, especially if you're talking about business. If you are speaking about business, you better look like business. All right, if you go somewhere, you're going to be talking about how to make money. Don't go in there looking like your clothes are from Walmart. That don't make any sense. All right, all right, all right, that's all the money you got is to make, buy clothes from Walmart. Why am I going to listen to you? It doesn't make any sense. Now, you're a teacher, so it's a little bit different, but you want to impress your audience. You know, like they say, dress to impress. So you want to impress your audience so that they'll listen to you and understand that people judge a book by its cover. Even though the saying is don't judge a book by its cover, we all do it. People judge you based on how you present yourself. So people judge me when they see me with the white tee or a tank top and a hat on and the tattoos. They judge me and they perceive me a certain way. Now, you know, I run my own shit, so I, don't, I can do what I want to do. So if I want to put on a suit, I can. If I want to dress like this, I can. But if I was working at a school as a teacher and I know I got to sell myself to those parents, I'm going to think about or how do I need to present myself so the parents respect me? Because some of them work as you know, places where they got to wear a suit and tie. Or places where you know, they want their kids to be learning from somebody that the parent respects. And if you in there looking like, if you dress like I'm dressed right now working at a school, the parents might be looking at you kind of funny. Like, yo, who, what's up with dude? You know, so that's what you got to think about. You might not like it, but that's the game. So sometimes in life you got to play the game. So I didn't like wearing a uniform at McDonald's, Foot Locker, Hat World, or Friendly's. But that was the game. Sometimes you got to play the game in life. Money May says, would trolling be highly pessimistic and vulgar or would it be redundant, dull, ad hominems? It's kind of, they all, that's all the same thing. <laughs> it's not either or, it's all the same thing. Swan Hotelier was good. You say you're the best out here. Trainer TG, you couldn't find that book list on your website looking for books on building my leadership. It's Dre All Day slash Reed, R-E-A-D. I haven't updated that list in a long time, but I might update it. We're working on a new website, actually, matter of fact. So, and that new site should be ready. Actually, the damn freelancer hit me up yesterday. I didn't hit him back yet. But when we get the new site out, that page will be ready. You'll be able to see that. Adrian said, I hated working retail because I had to work weekends. Yeah, that's the deal. That's the deal when you're in retail. Weekends are required. Sports lover said, what should an employee do if he gets yelled at by customers? Uh, calm the customer down. 
uh, under, let them understand that you understand why they're yelling. People just want to be heard. Somebody's yelling this because they feel like nobody's paying attention. So it takes a little bit of empathy. When what else is it possible for an employer to not add substance to your life? Yeah, I mean, ain't none of those employers add no real substance to my life. I just took those away from the situation. Not like they sat me down and said, Dre, let me teach you something. I was listening and paying attention. So I remember these things, but they weren't trying to give me, no, they weren't trying to school me. I was just paying attention. So yes. Ball Hog said, I hear your point for sure. I appreciate your answer. Facts only, especially as a black male and a white dominated staff. Yeah, so Ball Hog, now that you gave me that context, absolutely. Now that I know what you just said, yes. When you should dress, this is what you should do, Ball Hog. You should outdress everybody who works there. You should be the sharpest dressed dude in the building. Because if you're, you're a black guy in a white dominated place and you're even thinking about that, they probably thinking about it too. They probably looking at you like, all right, he's the only black dude in here. Now he better be, you, gonna have, you might have to be 10 times better. I don't know if you heard me talk about that, but in the professional speaking world, as a black guy, you know, seeing how I present myself online and when people look me up for a speaking gig, they Google me. So they're gonna see, they're gonna see videos like this. They're gonna see pictures like this. So I gotta be, I better be damn good when I get on that stage. Cause they're looking at like, all right, this dude, basketball player, you work on your game. He be talking all kind of crazy shit on the internet. Like, he gonna do a speaking gig? What's he gonna talk about? So I know I better be perfect when I get on that stage. So you gotta be better than all that. So if I'm, not, I'm doing a speaking gig and there's three other you know, white dudes with khakis on, I'm gonna be 10 times better than all three of them. Why? Cause that's just the game. So yes, be the sharpest dude in there. So go to, um, if you, I don't know how much you into fashion, but go to a department store, find you a stylist, you know, bring your stylist with you. If you know somebody who's real fashionable or your girl's fashionable, whatever, bring them with you and you know, get you a whole wardrobe, be the sharpest dude in the school. So when you walk in, they're like, damn, dude is on point. And then hopefully you got value you know, when you actually teach. Maximum Skilla said, I might've missed this comment, let me see. We'll go ahead and post it again. I'm looking to see if I see it. I don't see anything. If you posted something, go ahead and post it again. Maximum skill. All I see is, I see it said you joined, but I don't see anything else that you said. So if I missed you, go ahead and post it again. I'm just answering questions right now for those who came in later. The topic here today, I was talking about the best advice that I ever got from bosses that I work for, the best things that I gleaned from them is the better way of saying it because they didn't actually give me advice. These are just things that I noticed because I'm, I'm just a person who pays attention. So next question is from, where are we at? Uh, Money May says, how many freelancers have I fired so far? I can't even tell you. Do they whim and mutter when this occurs or do they lay just don't give a damn? I don't know. Because if I fire them, I'm not talking to them no more. So I really don't care what they said. <laughs> Trainer TG says, yeah, get that work in your game book. There you go. This book right here. You get that when you go to Mirror of Motivation. So when you get this on the next page, we'll offer you this. Mirrorofmotivation.com. So it said, literally the only black male on the staff, all the students are black. You like that though? I'll dress the whole staff. Yeah, I'll dress the whole staff. That way they ain't got nothing to hold against you. As long as your work is good, they ain't got nothing to hold against you. And the parents will respect you a lot too because you set an example for the kids. Mozart, yeah, stay suited and booted. It don't even have to be a suit, just be sharp. You know what I mean? It don't have to be a suit. You can get yourself some, some nice button-ups, some nice slacks. Get yourself some nice shoes. Invest in a nice pair of shoes, ball holic. That's the best advice I can give you. I'm not a big fashion dude, but I bought me, I had some loafers that I paid like a buck 80 for. It was like some uh, Lacoste. And things fell apart, but then I invested like six hundred and some um, some Ferragamos, and them things have been they have more than paid for themselves already. Just in the way that people perceive me when I walk in the room with those on, and they still look brand new, and I had them for like four years. I don't wear them that much, but that's the that's the point. Is that yeah, get you some nice shoes, or <laughs> just do that. Shoes, the shoes are big, especially on a man, a woman as well. But get yourself some nice shoes. You want to invest in something big money. Invest money in some shoes because they'll last forever. Some, some Ferragamo, some Louis, some Gucci, something like that. They'll last forever. They won't never fall apart. It's high quality shit. Now, that's one area of fashion where they cost a lot for a reason. It's, it's high quality material. Maximum skill set. I practice ball two hours a day. I want to play pro. What do I do to stay determined and keep making new goals? First of all, get this book, Mirror of Motivation. 
www.mirrormotivation.com is where you get the book, mirrormotivation.com. And next thing you can do is join us at Work On Your Game University. So you can get that. First of all, you can learn and apply to Work On Your Game system. And then you can be part of our community so you can you know, ask questions, get your questions answered by me and other members of the community. And we got plenty of things you can get access to. We got different levels of the membership. So depending on the level you join, we got all our courses in there, Bulletproof Mindset course, the Discipline course, Confidence course, Selling Yourself course, the Content Machine course. We got so many courses in there and I'm always adding new material. We got monthly Q&As, we got monthly coaching calls, monthly workshop sessions, weekly coaching calls, depending on the level that you join at. Now it's different levels again. So uh, check so check that out. So get the book first, then go to work on your game university.com. Tristan from Long Island. Sports lover said jeans for an interview. It depends on what the job is. Yeah, get them shoes. That's a big thing. All right, so that's it, everybody. I'm going to wrap this up. Tomorrow, I'm going to do another part of this. Again, mirrormotivation.com. This is where you get the free book. The book is already paid for. All you do is cover the shipping. Tomorrow, I'll give you parts. I think we're on number five through five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine, ten, whatever. We'll see how far we go tomorrow. That's that. Everybody have a great Wednesday. Work on your game. Be out of here. Dre all day.